And welcome to a, another edition of Radio Friends again. You know, this whole thing started back almost a couple of years ago now. And uh, we just, uh, you know, initially planning the WDRC um, 100th reunion um, without the radio station. So we all <laughs> we all had such a great time getting together. We decided after the reunion, we'd still stay together. And that's what we do. And uh, this is the 29th of March, um, Good Friday, going right into Easter weekend. And uh, we got a nice group with us this morning. So why don't we do this? I'll uh, I'll start things off, um, and then I'll uh, I'll throw it to you, individual guys. And if you could just quickly say, you know, um, where you're um, coming in from today. All right. So uh, I'm Steve Parker, doing it here from Berlin, Connecticut, in the uh, broadcast bunker. And uh, let's throw it to uh, let's see, let's throw it to the judge, Judge Harrigan. Good morning. I'm here in my hunting lodge in Marlboro, Connecticut. All right. And uh, Ed Bruder is back. Uh, you can always catch uh, Ed at WDRCOBG.com. How you doing, Ed? Good. I'm checking in from the uh, the Connecticut Northern Bureau in Manchester, New Hampshire. <laughs> and that's really Connecticut Northern. All right. Uh, Ted Dalek, who is back, just got off of his uh, got off his motorcycle and uh, after a long 65 mile ride to get together with some of our brotherhood. How you doing, Ted? Where are you coming from today? I'm doing great. I'm still, I'm back in uh, Venice, Florida, on the West Coast of Florida. Had a great lunch with the, the judge and uh, also Lee Gordon. We had a good time and good chat and uh, good to be back with you. Bob Craig. Oh, hey, Bob, you still up in Pennsylvania? Where are you coming to us from? Still here, still in Philly, the home of Philly International Records and Sigma Sound. Bob Marks, a couple of people call him Bart Mazzarella. I still call him Bob Marks. Bob, where are you coming from? Well, I'm here at Big D South in Vero Beach, Florida, home of Piper Aircraft on Florida's East Coast, just about an hour, 15-minute drive north of West Palm Beach. That's on I-95. Don't take US-1. What exit? I'm coming down there, so what exit do I have to take? Exit take 47. Pay attention to exits. Exit 47. All right. I'll be my, my exit? My yeah. exit? It, it's the Route 60 Vero Beach exit. That's all I can tell you. All right. And we got uh, Dave Overson who piped in there. Dave, you're down there too still? Yes, I'm still down here in uh, Jensen Beach. Uh, Jensen Beach. Uh, Recording in progress. One, 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 one. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, you're um, in Jensen Beach? No, I'm in Port St. Lucie. Sorry. I'm in Port St. Lucie, Florida. I'm about 45 minutes away from BART, south of BART. And uh, we're at exit... Uh, uh, 120, Steve, if you decide to come down, you come down the Crosstown Parkway to Route 1, take a right, <laughs> go down a few ways, you see Mediterranean Boulevard North, take a right on the Mediterranean Boulevard North, and we're <laughs> number 28 on the, on the left. Sounds like you're trying to get to a betting barn. Uh, how, yes. about, uh, how about John Landry, John? Uh, I'm from uh, Middletown, Connecticut. Uh, it's kind of cloudy out here today, but looking forward to a nice uh, Easter weekend. A nice group of folks this morning. Ron Pell's here. Hi, Ron. You still in your new digs? New digs in Cheshire. I'm about 15 miles due west of John Landry, maybe maybe 10 miles. And uh, today it's going to be sunny, high in the mid-50s, and it's going to be possibly 60 on Easter Sunday. So it's a nice weekend here in the Northeast. And Jack Lawrence is back. Hi, Jack. Hey, Steve. How you doing? I can't never say that at the airport. Never say hi, Jack. <laughs> hi, Jack. <laughs> No. Uh, Otis used to, I used to live in Agawam. Otis always used to introduce me as Lawrence of Agawam when I was following him on the air. So we're here in rainy Boston. Feels like January outside, actually. And huh. Dick, Dick called us back. Hi, Dick. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I switched computers. I am sorry that it uh, created a. The Amalfi Coast. Yes, the Amalfi Coast, one of my favorite places. Uh, it's about uh, 72 degrees and uh, very nice here, actually. <laughs> I'm still under the geodesic dome in Westport, where it is. Uh, you, They may think it's 40 or 41 degrees, but I, I believe it's 75 degrees here. What can I tell you? But here I am in Westport, and it's lovely. Hey, Dick, you also brought a special guest today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, who's joining us? Well... Joining us this morning is Dick Ferguson. Dick is uh, probably joining us from Fairfield, uh, although he is becoming a mariner, a Maine resident now, but former resident of Westport. 
And uh, Dick has been in the radio business uh, for many, many years, uh, probably every bit of uh, what, maybe uh, 60, close to that. Worked at WNHC in New Haven. I he was one of the first people I met when I came to New Haven and uh, uh, eventually became uh, the uh, chair of broadcasting for Cox Broadcasting. But before that, uh, Dick uh, built a broadcasting group of his own, including what WAAF in uh, in Worcester. That was your station, right? Yeah, we started with uh, WEZN. In uh, was yeah, our that's first right. Station. I should have remembered that. Oh, <laughs> uh, hang on, hang on one second. I I zipped over Russ Oasis, and Russ was one of the first guys to get on with us. I'm sorry, Russ. I went through hey, my. That's list. okay. I'm I'm here in in Miami, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> and now let's go back to dick ferguson go ahead dick oh thanks uh yeah so we started wezn in 1973 we bought the station for three hundred thousand uh, dollars wow. of which we borrowed virtually all of the money <laughs> and um we uh made payroll for the first two months i went out and traded two cars and then sold them for 50 cents on the dollar and uh, basically, that that's how we made payroll with the receipts from those cars. But uh, in its first rating book uh, in the spring of uh, 1974, with the exception of Morning Drive, WEZN had a 25 share. And wow. uh, that got it going. And then we bought WAAF in uh, Worcester, which uh, just celebrated its 50th year and, uh, and essentially went off the air. It was bought by the K-Love people. It's now a religious station. But... Was a very legendary rock and roll station for those absolutely of you who may have heard it with a wonderful signal that just <laughs> you know seemed to yeah great great station and then uh, and then we bought WZZK in Birmingham and uh, uh, through all of this we kind of went through some things we we sold the company to the Cats uh, rep firm uh, and then we bought it back from them and eventually we sold the company to Cox in Atlanta. In 1996, and I worked with them through 2006. And all told, I guess we had about 40 stations: uh, San Antonio, Birmingham, Tulsa, uh, Orlando, Atlanta, Syracuse, and, and Connecticut. I think so. Long Island and Long Island, right? Yeah, that came later. WBLI and WBAB. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for picking me up on that. Yeah. What a what a what a crazy great market that. That, that was holy crap. Oh, yeah, well, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> I used to buy that when I was at CRN. We would we were doing some work for Schick. And I was trying to buy yep. Long Island. And I had to go through those stations. And this is this is about 2000, Dick, I don't know, 2018, I'm going to say. Yeah, 18, it was 19, toward, yeah, it was the, yeah, end, the, the end. Yep. And dealing yep. with this, those stations was like, what the hell are these guys thinking or doing? It was crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, there's a big uh, WALK, of course, is you know the, you know the, one of the big guns out there. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, still. Yeah, yeah, but all, all three of those stations are still, um, yep. you know, very strong. I, I don't but think a, most yeah. people realize that that you know you think of Long Island as as like a market, but the reality is that Long Island almost is town to town. I mean, people in one town hardly acknowledge the existence of people in another town. It's just a, a whole bunch of, you know, individual communities sort of strung together in the so-called Nassau Suffolk rating book. So. People also don't realize there's 5 million people on Long Island, Nassau Suffolk. And it's probably, well, it always was a top 10 market all by itself. Remember they'd break that out as Long Island would have its own rating book. Dick, yeah. I don't even remember just an aside, but in 1980, Buckley had uh, Dick Corson fired a guy named Bill Hines, and he came in on the office and says, you're going to be the new general sales manager. That was 1980. And I moved my family, bought a house in Simsbury, became the general sales manager, and then I got a call from you and Jim Morley. And he said, we want to have dinner with you. And I met you at the Chart House in Simsbury oh, wow. in it was 1980. And you guys offered me the general sales manager's job in Worcester. And I had, oh, and real? I, you don't remember this. You were driving a Porsche at the time. Uh, I don't You're remember right. what model it was. But I said, SC, right. I said, I would love to work for you guys. You're, you're, you're at that part. At that point, you're the company was called New Park uh, or Park New, City New, Broadcasting or yeah, New City. Park City, and then it became New City. New right. City. 
And I was said, oh, my God. And I had to turn it down. I had just moved. Literally, within two weeks earlier, I moved, moved my family, new job, the whole thing. And as a matter of fact, I would have reported to Rich Reese, who I believe yep. was your general manager in Worcester at that time. Rich is a great guy. He also worked for Buckley for a while in Syracuse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know. He's living down in is, Florida now. He's in, uh, I yeah, think, in the Longboat Key. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I run it. I, I run into him. I have some conversations, uh, email, or whatever, every, every now and again with Rich. Great guy. But yeah. um, I always regretted that. I couldn't, just couldn't pull the trigger on that. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for telling that story. I appreciate it. Yeah. 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 That was a great station. Was was um, oh. was Barry Grant there then? Barry, uh, at which station? Uh, at AAF. I don't remember him being there. Um, you know, like I said, we bought it from George Gray in 1975 or six. Mm -hmm. George was convinced, by the way, that we would never make the payment. We paid $1.6 million for the station. He gave us a note, I think, for something around a million dollars, and we we somehow came up with the 600000 He owned stations in New Bedford, WBSM, I think uh, it was called letters. And um, he he decided to stay in Worcester because he was convinced we would default on the note and he could take the station back. <laughs> and... Of course, AAF became a monster radio station. And uh, after about three years, uh, George and his lovely wife moved back to New Bedford. And uh, did any of you guys know George Gray at all? No? Didn't know him. He, he owned a station that uh, broadcast in Portuguese in uh, New Bedford. New Bedford. And, 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 do you remember that station? And it, there was a huge Portuguese uh, population out there. There's one in Fall River, W-A-L-E, which is... Uh, that's Which the is station. Portuguese. Yeah. 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 Did you buy WBLI from Beck Russ? The WBLI, we did buy WBLI. Yeah. From, and from WBAB. Communications? Pardon? From Beck Ross? Yeah, I think it was from Beck Ross. Right. Yeah. Th those stations um, were amazing. A and probably one of the finest moments um, uh, that I was associated with it was on 9 11. And um, that team got together and people from Long Island all over, they were trot. You know, the station was on the Sunrise Highway. It was like in its own little building there. And um, the people were, we had a lot of firemen and cops who, who listened to the station. And they, we literally, um, people were bringing generators, all kinds of stuff, to, and then trucking it down, uh, you know, to where the Twin Towers were. And um, uh, it was one of the station's finest moments. Those are great radio stations. Hey, Dick. Steve, you ask about he, the Barry Grant. I think he was in Worcester when it was still AABFM, which became okay. AAF. Yeah. Well, he came down to New Haven. I hired him to come down to New Haven. It was in uh, 76, I think it was. So oh, Dick, that would thank you. Really thank you. Got to tell that story. You got to tell the Barry Grant story. And that's, that's a classic. <laughs> Who, me? Well, yes, I love that story. I hate to pick on the departed, but uh, <laughs> now Barry, ahead, Barry right? and I, Barry and I had our um, good days and bad days, but uh, we were, uh, this was, um, well, first of all, I just wanted to say when I left WPLR, this was in October. Uh, it was uh, the day before John Lennon died. As a matter of fact, no, the, the day after John Lennon died, because the last thing I did was a, an editorial or obit on John because we had had John, as you know, on the station or years earlier. And um, uh, uh, I made an offer to Bob Herpy, who he, accept, he accepted. I offered to buy PLR for $3.2 million. And I called Dick and I said, um, where do I find money for this? And, and Dick gave me the uh, uh, contact information up in Boston. Oh, uh, T.A. Bill Egan, right, yeah. And Bill Egan, that's who it was. And um, I went up to meet with Bill Egan and I took Barry with me uh, because he kept talking to me about uh, joining him at the Connecticut Radio Network. And uh, we had a lovely conversation about WPLR and I gave him uh, about a 25 page overview on it. And he said, uh, geez, you know, that sounds great, but 
uh, interest rates are so high, you'll never be able to pay the debt service. But tell us more about the Connecticut Radio Network. That seems a lot more interesting to us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, and then about a week after that, Bob got an offer of about $6 million and he called me and I said, I'm not going to hold you. Uh, you take the $6 million, <laughs> you know, because it was like 18, 19% days back then. And it was, uh, but that was a long time ago. Uh, that's a, a very interesting history of WPLR of which Mr. Ferguson played a dramatic, dramatic uh, role in its growth. And uh, so I'm so pleased that he's here with us today. And, well, having uh, grown up in uh, in Hamden, you know, literally virtually under the tower there and having yes, gotten yes. Well, you know the building. <laughs> yeah. And w one of my first jobs was with 1220 WDEE, which right. became WCDQ. And, and then we that? bought it and it became WOMN and PLR. Woman Radio. Yep. Right. Woman Radio. Yeah. Yeah. The only radio station I knew of that I had sold out 100% of its sales inventory for three months before we went on the air, just on the concept. And yeah. uh, it was a bomb. But that's, you know, that's <laughs> but the concept. So I, I, I have to say a little history on that. So WDEE was um, right near the, uh, it, had, it was a two tower AM, 1220 on the dial. And it was located at the, it's now, it was a dead end road at the time called Denslow Hill Road. Yep. And it's right up, if you guys know where the WELI uh, towers are and the uh, and broadcast center. And uh, WDEE, uh, there was a fire and it burned That's to the fire. ground. And um, the, the owner, a guy named Stu Caden, who used to work at Channel 8, I believe, um, you know, could only put, he had enough money to put just the AM back on the air because, quote unquote, nobody listened to FM back in those days. And um, he was desperate for money. So he sold the license 101.3, which became KC 101, to Dan Copps mm -hmm. for you sitting down, $50,000. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, wow. Copps immediately put it up on Gaylord Mountain, kind of like the rest is history. So that was what, about 68, 69? Yeah, I think so. Something like that. I graduated from college in 67. So it was around that time. Yeah, yeah because then then I was offered, uh, that was when um, I got my famous offer of uh, sales managership of KCI, which turned into going over to WPLR after 25 minutes. <laughs> that was, uh, That's when KCI was job. in North, North Haven, right? Al Pellegrino. Yes, the Al offered me the job and uh, I took it and uh, and um, uh, uh, Marshall Pipe went crazy. And um, I came into uh, work on Saturday morning, you know, with a box full of stuff and everything. Phone rang and came in at 10, got fired at 1025 and made a deal with Bob Herpy at 1027. Oh my God. <laughs> Probably one of the best moves of your life. That's Absolutely. Right. Without question. Without question. Oh, we have many. Dick and I have many. It's it's just been a very very rich history. But we're I'm so glad you're joining us, Richard. Thank you. Nice to be here. Well, I tell you, you know, it's it's always great when someone new comes in because, as you can see, Dick, as soon uh, as soon as you have somebody else come in, it, it kind of generates a a whole bunch of other stories and radio stations and and just just great stuff. But you know, and and actually, I'm I'm so glad you joined us because uh, Dick Colt had sent me that that uh, note uh, a couple of times and uh, I know we had put you on the email list. So it's really great that you got there, but you know, I, I, I we were going to talk today and we always go off in a different direction about, you know, what else we would have done if we didn't do radio, but you know, something, something I always wanted to do and you and Dick, you really touched upon it. Uh, Dick Ferguson, when you mentioned how the radio station really, um, really took uh, center stage and really shined and made a difference when the towers came down, maybe, maybe we should do that. Um, let's go around the room and just, uh, anyone who wants to pipe in, um, and just, uh, tell us, um, you know, uh, what, what your station did when the towers came down. Well, I'll start by saying that, um, I remember, uh, our, our technical director for the whole group. So we were located in uh, our offices in Bridgeport where 99.9 was. And, um, I was walking out of my office to get a cup of coffee or something. It was like around quarter to nine that morning. And um, the, our engineering guy for the whole company walked by and said, you know, what? I heard a plane just hit like one of the one of the towers. And um, 
15 minutes later, um, you know, the whole thing was unfolding. And we were, you know, pretty much a beautiful music station. And we had a deal with Channel 8. We just plugged Channel 8 right into 99.9. And, you know, they went to ABC coverage. And, you know, that's how, you know, we covered it that day. Our, uh, I, worked at, I worked at ESPN. And that day was, I uh, gotten the word that the, the uh, towers were down. <laughs> oh, excuse me. So I rushed into work. The whole place was guarded. I was running ESPN News at the time, and we we became a sports from a sports news uh, network to a uh, regular uh, station a nationwide network because ABC kept feeding us information because they lost their tower, so they fed us the information and then we were putting it out over the air. And our guys really worked diligently and. I think they many of them worked a 13 hour a day that day. And even when there was nothing going on, the guys did not want to leave their posts. They wanted to stay there. And I was glad they did. And they were ripping off labels off, off uh, cassettes and stuff like that just to keep busy. And then when something broke, we were right there. We had a crew ready to go. And uh, that was a really unusual and exciting uh, day in, a, in, in the broadcast industry. Me, I know that. I mean, uh, when when Hurricane Andrew hit Florida in '92, I owned WXDJ, and it was on the 2,000 foot tower in Homestead that was the Channel Six tower, and uh, that tower came down because because Hurricane Andrew absolutely hit spot on uh, Homestead. And it brought the tower down, and I thought that was going to be complete disaster for the station. We got a temporary uh, authorization to move to downtown Miami, which was a lower tower at less power, but it actually served our audience better. And that was uh, really, as soon as we moved downtown, our ratings went through the roof. And uh, that, along with another station that we bought, we ended up selling for $111 million. Nice day at the office. Which was a good thing, so the hurricane <laughs> was bad. a great thing. We call it St. Saint, Saint Andrew. <laughs> We had something like that here at VBF in Boston uh, during Hurricane Gloria in 1985. We were standing outside watching the hurricane, and all of a sudden, one of the um, one of the wires on the tower started getting flick. It was flickering, and the engineer came and said, "We've got to get out of here." And that thing just came down and went right through the building. Wow. I think they even have they even have pictures of it on uh, YouTube. Uh, nobody got hurt, if wow. you can believe that. But it went right through the center of the building. We were off the air for about a day or so. And then we Which got back station on. was that? WVBF, Framingham, Boston. We had studios in Framingham then, yeah. yeah. Virginia B. Fairbanks. Yeah, that's right. I was also on the air the night uh, the Hartford Civic Center. Remember the ice storm? Uh, the yeah. roof came in? Yep. Some guy called me up at 3 in the morning, and I thought he'd had a few. He goes, the whole Civic Center just caved in. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <clears throat> then I turn on the TV, and I see it's on Channel 3. So I called up. I think Ken Tremble was the news director at the time. Yeah, I called he was. was. Yeah. Yep. So I called him up, and he says, what's going on? I said, Channel 3's there already, the uh, Civic Center, the ha. Uh, the whole roof just went in, and luckily there was a basketball tournament there before, and everybody was out of there because it could have been a real could have yeah, been a real I was, tragedy. I was there with Wayne Mulligan the night before, and it was uh, Rhode Island against uh, I think yeah. UConn, and uh, so I kept going out getting the scores and feeding them back into it. Uh, but about five thirty that morning, or five fifteen in the morning, Brad Davis called me and says the roof is in, roof caved in, the roof fell down. I go. What roof? What roof? What do you? Our roof, you know. And he, he's, uh, he's like, no, no, no. The Civic Center roof. You got to get down there. So <clears throat> I drove down there, and I was walking along, and I ran into and Ted Dalek, who may remember this name, Sal Maganaro. Yeah, he used to do, used to do uh, the traffic. Traffic. Yeah. <clears throat> so I saw Sal. I said, "Oh, what's going on? The roof?" I, I saw some bricks and stuff on the ground. I said, well, it "Just hit the edge, or?" What's going on? He said, no, Dave, you got to go in. He says, go into the Sheridan and go up on, yeah, up on the top floor right, and look down. I you can look I down did and it. went down and I went, holy moly. That thing was mm -hmm. just. Yeah, it just went right in. So that would have been that would have been the worst worst disaster in the country, even worse than the circus fire. Because yeah. you would have had hundreds of thousands, at least a thousand people dead. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember um, the Hartford Whalers had to play their home games up in Springfield. Yeah. Yeah. And, I went yeah. to a Bru- I went to a Bruins Hartford Whalers game on the Springfield Civic Center. I couldn't believe it. I went it's such a small building. You know, but yeah. I remember, yeah. You know, the TIC staff, the TIC AM, uh, mostly and, and FM, I guess, the TIC staff had been staying at the at the Sheraton Hotel because of the snowstorms. And we were doing snow coverage, so they put us up in the hotel. And I remember Bob Dunn, who was he was in sales, who was sales manager at the time, got up. He said he looked out his window that morning uh, or that evening, and he saw the roof caved in, and everybody was already just two blocks away at the hotel. We all shuffled over to the radio station, and we were there uh, continuously broadcasting AM and FM for three days, I think three or four days, when everything was closed. I didn't get home for three or four days during that time. We were on the air, rotating people, just moving in and out. They brought in food. We were, they stayed at the hotel at night. We went back into the radio station in the morning. It just uh, it was an incredible amount of time. And, uh, and, it's, uh, and you, you mentioned uh, uh, the Hurricane Gloria. Uh, yeah. Jack, when uh, that hit, yeah. I was not in broadcasting at the time, but I, I was in Glastonbury and a tree fell on my house and poked a hole in the roof. And oh. I had a boat on a dock in uh, Noink, Connecticut. So after everything settled down, I said, well, let's go down and take a look and see if the boat made it. And we pulled into the, in the evening, pulled into the parking lot and the entire marina was gone. Everything had well, shifted up onto a bank and all the boats were bobbing up and down and my boats banging up and down. It was what a what a nightmare, and I was not in broadcasting at the time, but that that those pictures stay in your mind for a long time. Oh sure, right. yeah. I have a, a recording in the collection of WBZ in Boston, um, August of 1954, when Hurricane Carol brought down the BZ antenna on the building, <laughs> and Carl DeSouz was doing live um, narration of of storm coverage. When all of a sudden these people start shouting in the background, and down comes the tower. You hear it crashing <laughs> through the roof. <laughs> They uh, narrowly missed a couple of secretaries in the upper floors, so there were no injuries, but uh, the building was pretty badly damaged. Was that the no, AM TV. tower that came down? Is that what? Was it the AM tower that came down? It was out in Hull, right? It might have been the TV tower that came down. Didn't the TV they, tower. Yeah. Didn't they have an auxiliary, they had an auxiliary tower in the parking lot, didn't they? Yeah. They had, they they had used an to. auxiliary tower right in the parking lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, they did. Yeah, that tower's down now. It's gone. Now there's a, building, there's a new building? place in there. Hi, Chris. Hi there. Chris Tracy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, you, nobody wants to know about me. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a chief engineer for uh, iHeart in Hartford and in Springfield. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, they've been around these parts for quite some time and looking forward to retiring. <laughs> so. well, we think we always jump. We always enjoy when someone new jumps on. So thanks a lot for uh Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Tracy hey, Carmen's hey. uh, passed it up. Nice to meet you, Chris. Steve, I've you got guys. to run. I've got a meeting I have to go to. But I'm so happy that Dick could join us. And uh, nice to meet you, Chris. And I'm glad that I could be here as well. You, sir. Yeah. And um, someday I'll tell you about my start in radio and how it led to the carpeting business. But that's a whole different story. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh very simple. But I've never had a tower fall, so I, I that's all I can tell you. <laughs> yeah. But I did one time install a TV antenna on top of Chapel Street so I could point it to New York so I could bootleg WNEWFM's audio. Another story sometime. <laughs> well, you should also tell the story about the guy who lived next door to you who was upset with your two-way antenna. Uh, I believe his name was Meatloaf, right? Uh, yeah, that was, that was at home. <laughs> that was, yeah. he was my next door neighbor. Actually, we, uh, we'd known each other from PLR because Meatloaf was one of the very few performers we could bring in, put him in the studio and leave him alone. And he could do the day part. He yep. was, that wow. And, that's and cool. Just knew what he wanted to do. And that's what we did. And when I moved to Westport, the first person I met was my next door neighbor, and it happened to be Meatloaf. He happened to be renting the uh, house next door. And uh, so uh, we lived next door to each other for a couple of years. And um, a very, very interesting personality, I have to say. <laughs> but a very nice guy. I uh, And uh, he he is missed. There's no question. Yeah, anyway, and your Times this. has a policy of referring to people with their full name at the beginning. And then any other time during the article... They refer to him as Mr. So the article is Obit, Mr. Loaf. 
Well, his, 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 <laughs> his real name was Marvin A. Day. Marvin and Lee A. Day. You, yep. didn't call, you didn't call him Marvin A. Day. And I knew him by that name, but he always said, come on, Dick, just call me Pete. Let's be done with it. He was a girl <laughs> softball coach. Yeah. I you, yeah, you, yeah. you told me the story where um, you, you moved in next to him, I guess it was, or he moved in next to you. At any rate, you you, you put those giant uh, 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 shortwave antennas up. And, and and I guess he was concerned about uh, TV. Radiation and death. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Dick calls Dick calls Meatloaf house and he, he gets a hold of Mrs. Meatloaf who answers the phone. <laughs> and then and he says, uh, he says, I, I need to talk to your husband. And and she goes, Meat, come here. There's somebody <laughs> on the phone. <laughs> that's 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 how he was known in the house and everywhere else. Wouldn't you have loved to see them take their vows? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you meet <laughs> yeah. if you agree to meet say, with your wife. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't know well, if you guys before you have leave, ever seen I, the I, video. I have to tell you, Dick, before you leave, I have to tell you I'm very, very disappointed. Uh because uh, Ted Dalaku promised me that his uh he was inspired by your stories and he was going to do his uh he was gonna attend the meeting in the nude today. But <laughs> there he, we go. I'm, I'm very disappointed. And Ted, if you need me to send you the picture as a model for what you should be doing, it's not a problem. <laughs> and and I had, by the way, I had guys... a picture in my mind, but it just, you know, I started to dress up like that. And my wife looked at me and said, nobody wants to see that. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> I am with, with you guys and all my clothes on. It's probably better for everybody. Yeah, the emperor's new clothes. <laughs> if you guys want to watch a great video, uh, if you haven't seen it, um, Meatloaf's video, which you can get on YouTube, of Paradise by the Dashboard oh, Light. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Isn't that, oh, yeah, is that awesome. the best or what? Yeah. The one Nobody where he sweated up. more than he did. Is, yeah. is it the one where he acts it out on stage? Yeah, kind of. He's, well, he's got he's got the gal with him. Yeah, he's throwing her great. around. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then the best the best line of that whole thing. And now I'm praying for the end of time. <laughs> yeah. So I can end, so my, I can time end my time with you. <laughs> great. See I know you here in Boston that uh, see you guys somebody... next week. Thank you for your indulgence. <laughs> Thanks, Dick. Take care, Dick. Take care, Dick. All right, talk to you later. I know here in Boston at WRKO, they made a version in Paradise by the Dashboard Light. They pulled out Phil Rizzuto's voice and put in Tip <laughs> Stockton for the Red Sox. And how, they did it, how they did it technically in those days, I don't know. But I remember Harry Nelson mentioned it to me, that the guy that did it. And it was, uh, they used to play it all the time. But you need to expect to hear uh, the regular version with Phil Rizzuto, only it would come yeah. out with Stockton for the Red Sox. So. Yeah, that's funny. RKO used to play that, yeah. And it's true that uh, Phil Rizzuto didn't know what he was recording when he did that, right? That is um, correct. Boy, yeah, he had no idea. Yeah. Huh. Ron and I are 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 uh, fans of the um, of the Tony Kornheiser show. Right. And, and the guy who wrote Paradise at, on the uh, uh, the dashboard light was a classmate of Kornheiser's in high school. So he talks he talks about him and uh, and some of his other achievements uh, on a on a fairly regular basis. Who is that? Was that uh, Jim Steinman? Steinman, Jim Steinman yeah. Jimmy Steinman. He, yeah. I think he died last year or the year before, but uh, but he uh, he created that and and a bunch of other things that you would uh, that you would recognize. Hey Lee, did you mug the Easter Bunny this morning? Yeah, <laughs> I, I I figured even though it's not it's not Easter yet, uh, this is the closest. Uh, this is the closest <laughs> opportunity. So uh, you look marvelous. <laughs> For those who celebrate. <laughs> to, to For those who celebrate, that. yes. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was either that or uh, or put on my uh, my uh, my Chinese restaurant bib, but uh... <laughs> a Chinese restaurant was really good. I enjoyed that. Yeah, Tracy well, did a great job. Chris joined us early, uh, at yeah, an earlier Tracy. visit. Yeah, uh, uh, and, uh, and yeah, it was uh, great to meet you guys. Yeah, sorry that yeah. Uh, Bart couldn't make it. Uh, this time but uh yeah dave and uh dave and tracy and i and then and then uh, just uh monday uh you, uh maybe you guys already mentioned it before i jumped on but uh judge and ted and i had a very nice uh lunch over in fort myers on monday yeah sorry i missed that one yeah 
I, I see that, uh, and I don't know if he's still here. I see that John Doolittle jumped on. John, are you still there? Okay. Yeah, John. No, uh, board him. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we may have. Yeah, because John Doolittle of the Doolittle Radio Corporation, his, his dad was Franklin. Um, he still loves our Zooms and watches them all the time. So, uh, And he brings us some interesting tidbits. So he jumped out a little while ago and um, I always wonder what John Doolittle's reaction when Dave sent out the blooper tape. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I Is so that hard. the Doolittle for from DRC? Yep. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. him. Wow. That's his. Yeah, uh, as a yeah. kid, their their family lived in Hamden, so it was interesting when you guys were talking about Hamden earlier. Oh yeah, well you know it's inter yeah. interesting because I I'm reading to the blind uh, the Connecticut Radio Information System for years, and um, uh, one time we got a. Um, uh, a donation from a, um, a Mrs. Doolittle from Hamden, Connecticut. And I said, um, do you know who Mrs. Doolittle is? And I explained that to them. And a few years go by and the, a little pink message slip came to me again at Christmas. They said, this message is for Steve Parker. Mrs. Doolittle is still alive. <laughs> and I thought that was great. Just thinking that she's listening to, to what we're doing. But um, uh, let's see. We also I also want to mention that Tracy Carmen joined us. We saw him earlier. Um, yeah, he just popped out. And uh, oh, hey, Dad. And <laughs> uh, there again, yep. And Jim Harrington's here, but he's back again. But uh, yeah, you know, it's 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 really interesting. And and Ron, I wanted to throw back to you again because um, talking about those disasters, tell them about what happened when that tornado came through. I know you've mentioned it before in the past, but talk about how the station reacted to that. Well, it was <laughs> Orson went into. Um... He was, <laughs> he was running around the building like crazy because the tornado missed us. I mean, but it was pitch black Yeah. because um, the tornado really was hit further north by the airport. But everything went black. Uh, you know, that, I don't I don't recall because it was in the afternoon. This this was like yeah. late late in the afternoon. It wasn't it was like three o'clock you know, in the afternoon. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. it, was it wasn't like 9-11. You know, now you mentioned 9-11. I remember that morning I was sitting in my office and Eric Fano, who was Rick Buckley's nephew, who was working at the station at the time, comes into my office. I was getting ready for a sales meeting. And he said, uh, you might want to come into the conference room and see what's going on. I said, what? He says, well, just come in. And then we had a big screen TV in the conference room and the first tower had gone down. And um, that was that was the, what we did. We, I know I'm kind of getting away from what you mentioned to you, but what we did was in those days, Wayne had a hookup or had a, had an agreement with Channel 30 that we would broadcast the news at six o'clock in the evening. And uh, and his thinking was the next morning when people would turn on the radio, they would be turning on or turn on television they or whatever. Somehow they would connect with with the, the radio station. But um, so that's what we did. We just plugged in Channel 30 news for the rest of that day. And, uh, you know, yeah, we plugged in Channel 8. That. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. Same idea, but it was uh, that was probably the worst day in, in my life I can remember broadcasting because you were just numb. I mean, you, you know, yeah. first of all, you, you know, and of course the TV stations would make it worse. Like we're you know America under attack. Okay, I mean, yeah, maybe, but you know, <laughs> it was like holy cow, we're just sitting there. The whole sales department was sitting in the room, not saying a word, just watching the Today Show and what was going on. And then later, and then strangely, so. Eric and Fano and I had a an appointment with a client down the street up in uh, up in Windsor. We were in Bloomfield at the time, and we go there, and this is like ten thirty or ten forty five, and they also had the TV on. It was a restaurant, and then suddenly the second plane hit, and that time, and, and we just it was like I you know it was just stunning. I just still to this day, just like it was just the most amazing day, most tragic day, I can recall in in my you know. 25 is 26 years in radio when that yeah, second tower came down that's when everybody knew this was not an accident yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i was working out in pittsburgh in the in suburban pittsburgh at the time they had a an oldie station that was located about uh 40 miles south of pittsburgh but it had a signal oh. that goes into oh. pittsburgh and um what was the uh, station they call it they call themselves the pickle. It was, but I was doing mornings and you do anything for a, you know, for a buck. Yeah. Uh, so I'm in radio. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, it was, 
it was crazy. Uh, we saw it on TV. Everything kind of stopped down. We, we went to ABC, which we were an affiliate of, and um, all of a sudden we hear this very low-flying jet airplane, and it flew literally. It was a passenger jet. We heard it. We saw it yeah. out the window. It went over. Our, we, had, we were on our tower site. That's where the studio was. It went right over our towers. And it, we were all were amazed at how low it was. And, it, and before you know it, it was gone. You know, that was flight 93. Yeah. You know, wow. That had, cut, that oh, had turned man. around, that had turned around over Cleveland. It had literally there. I had friends of mine in the Gulf uh, building in downtown Pittsburgh, which is a skyscraper. And they say it was a secondary target because east, uh, west of New York, it's the tallest building or it was then, you know, and so it literally, the, the plane had come down uh, at the confluence in Pittsburgh, gone down the Monongahela River, gone by Pittsburgh, kept going, and had gone over our studios down by a, a town called California, PA. Well, only in Pittsburgh, in uh, Pennsylvania would they have a, a town named after another state, but that's how they, they did it. <laughs> and uh, they went right over our building in about 30, maybe a minute later, uh, they were over Somerset, and you know what happened there. Yeah, and uh, that's it was. Terrible. And if you've ever had a chance, if you if you never had a chance to visit the uh, the site, uh, it's worth a trip to Flight ninety three. It's right out in the middle of this huge empty space, a field. Um, I mean, it's set back about a mile. You you can't see it from the road when you enter it but they do have a, a monument as you come in and you drive down this long road to the back of this field and you come to the, the area where the plane hit. And, um, I mean, it, it's desolate. Uh, you, you know, you, you can, you probably can, you can visualize that there was a struggle in the cockpit because if they had any kind of control at all, they made sure that it was not going to hit any place that was, you know, populated. And this thing came right down in the middle of the field. Still to this day, and it's, what, 23 uh, years later, the ground where the plane hit is still scorched. Wow. You know, it, uh, it, it is still brownish where the plane hit. Uh, it has never grown back. It could be from the jet fuel. Uh, but uh, And they have a terrific monument that they built and uh, it's very moving. If you get a chance, I know that in New York, that was the primary spot. But, you know, when you see what happened out in remote suburban uh, Pennsylvania, you realize that how serious it was, you know. Anyway, that's my story. I remember hearing the audio from a flight attendant. I think it was for Flight 93 or the other one. And she was as cool and as smooth as you could possibly be in such a terrifying situation. Yeah. It was like she was reading a script. Yeah. With, you know, all the the, the, the the fluency that you would expect of something like that. And like moments later, everybody was gone. That was where that uh, passenger Beamer said, let's roll. You know, yeah. where he got yeah. up and he said, let's roll. And they were going to go try to take the terrorists down. But I mean, gentlemen, I've got, excuse me. I'm sorry, Jim. I've got to jump off. I've got something off the air I have to go deal with. Uh, Happy Easter to all, and thanks for having me today. Take care, Chris. Chris. Hey, guys. Here, come back. Please come okay. back. <laughs> Will do. Thank you. That day of 9 11, I was on the air and I was doing news and traffic for three stations all under the same ownership and had just finished my last live report. It was about five minutes of nine. I went off duty at nine. And I walked back from the main studio into the uh, newsroom and happened to glance up at the TV and just in time to see the second plane hit. And that, of course, changed the day. I didn't go home at nine o'clock that day. But it was very strange because I had a sister who was living in Manhattan at the time, and I never even made that connection for about four hours afterwards. Wow. I never even thought of her because we were so busy trying to cover the event. Turned out she was fine, but it was, you know. It's funny what you think of and what you don't think of when you're under stress. Yeah, I mean, I had a cousin that actually worked in the World Trade Center. He was on the 51st floor, but he was on his way to a meeting uptown. And 
I finally called his mother, my cousin, and I just said, this is four days after. I'm watching, you know, all the replays, and I'm saying, oh, my God, Sean works in the, at the World Trade Center. So I called her right away, and she said, no, everything's fine. She says, uh, he was on his way uh, uptown when everything happened, and then he had to go back to his apartment in Battery Park to get his girlfriend out of the uh, his apartment, and they came out of the apartment. He was maybe maybe 15, 20 minutes later, that's when one of the buildings started coming down. So uh, it was, uh, I was hair raising, that's for sure. Guys, I don't know what I've missed because uh, I lost my internet, but I just got back in. I see you're still talking about 9-11. Uh, that morning I was on the air and I got uh, a call from a guy who said, hey, what do you know about an airplane that hit the World Trade Center? And I, uh, and I said, I didn't hear anything about that. So we decided we we're going to uh, look into it, found out it was an airliner. We turned on the TV in the studio just in time to see the, uh, the towers uh, on fire. And, you know, that's before they fell. And uh, suddenly, you know, I was at Christian FM radio. So we were playing music. We were doing this regular morning show with a lot of fun. And from that moment on, everything changed. And we were totally keyed into the disaster. And we were actually allowed to uh, use the network feed uh, for some of the news that was coming in. And then our general manager decided he'd get in touch with a number of local pastors. And they came into the building, sat in the studio all around. And they were doing their best to keep our listeners calm. They, they talked about... Um, faith during this time and pray for our country they were praying and we played some more solemn music we uh we got away from our regular uh, up tempo type of contemporary christian music and that entire day and uh, days after that was dedicated to that 9 11 disaster so i'll never forget that day what were the call letters of that station the call letters, well, we called it Christian FM, but it was WSCF. We're uh, located in Vero Beach. And today we syndicate our programming all over the United States. And we have over 250 affiliates. Wow. I have another interesting recording. It's a composite of ABC and NBC coverage of the plane that crashed into the Empire State Building. In yeah, I remember that? Wow. Yeah. And that was, it's interesting because the outcome was was so much different, but it was yeah. a military plane that got lost in the fog and it crashed in about two thirds of the way up to the-, the It was sky. a very small plane also. Yes. Yeah, it, was right. much and, it wasn't a jet Relatively line. speaking. Yeah, it was Rel relatively speaking, plane. yeah. Yeah, the yeah. guy the guy flew over Roosevelt Island and thought he was, and thought that was Manhattan. And right. so he thought he was higher up and thought he was further away and then- crashed into the into the building there was there used to be a show on public tv called history detectives and one of the stories they did was about a guy who was working across the street from the empire state building and 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 some of the debris from the from that crash uh either flew out of the empire state building and threw a window into his office or he just picked it up off the street but they basically they did a story to determine whether this this piece of of the uh, stuff that he picked up actually came from the plane and apparent and as I recall, as I recall, I think it did. It was a B twenty five bomber. Yeah, so not a small plane. Yeah, like a smaller than a seven fifty seven. Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah, guys remember how they responded initially to the first plane attack when they had the first plane hit the first tower? They were the networks were kind of excusing like, well, it must have been an accident. The pilot must have uh, right. had a problem. You know, they, they were just kind of dismissing it as being not terrors. They do that all the time nowadays. Nowadays, the first re reaction from the the people who do the press conferences is, well, we know, we don't think it was a terrorist attack. They, they, they were like that in Baltimore this week when the bridge collapsed. That's right. The first yeah. press conference, they did exactly what you just said, Jim. Yep. And but after the first plane hit, no, the networks were, well, it's a terrible thing. We'll have to keep our eye on it. Boy, look at the smoke coming out of the building. 
Uh, they don't think it, it, it must have been a, an accident on a part of one of the airliners, a miscalculation. They thought uh, it was that, a small plane, I think. Yeah, initially. they did initially. Yep. Right. I have a two hour board recording from WABC the morning that happened. And this recording starts about quarter of nine before either plane has hit. And um, it was Curtis Sliwa and whoever his on air partner was kind of a good guy, bad guy talk show. And yeah. um, they had the initial bulletin from their newsroom. And then they went back to the talk show after the first plane hit. And then the network came on and did a special report. And then they went back to the talk show some more until they realized, hey, this is bigger than that. Yeah, I was working at WTIC that day and the production room is right next door to the newsroom. And and so I heard I heard about the first plane on my way in. And yeah, you know, a an, an airplane crashing into the World Trade Center. It, it's similar to to what happened with the Empire State Building. You think, well, it's it's just it's just an accident. And, you know, until until the other stuff happened. It it didn't become obvious that it was that it was all planned and that it was a you know that it was a, it, it was in a whole operation. But I remember one thing that struck me from watching the TV that day was all these reporters all scattered around, do you know, kind of improvising and doing and and so many of them are these just these talking hairdos that just didn't. <laughs> that that just uh, they're speculating and the and they're saying we don't know this and we don't know that and because because of the nature of the story that they, they had to press pretty much everybody into service and CBS had Morley Safer who used to be a, a journalist reporter who was then just doing sixty minutes and he was he was standing uh, on on a rooftop in New Jersey with New York City smoldering in the background and he's giving his report and it just it struck me that he was so demonstrably better than anybody else I had seen yeah. that day in reporting he just he he didn't ever once mention something that was speculative or that wasn't a fact or didn't say what we don't know he just stood on this rooftop and presented information that we did know and it was just so such a contrast between that and what so many of the other reporters from all the other networks were were doing and acting and and it, it it was just that's that's one of the things other than the event itself and also when the first building and when the second building come down i can still hear joe fury um uh, just kind of screaming, look, you know, because the TV was on in the TIC newsroom, and and I I can still hear Joe Fury's voice say, "Look at that! Look at that! Look at that!" But 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 beyond the event itself, just the, the stark contrast between an old school reporter who knew what the hell he was doing and these and the the, the modern reporters who are just there because they're pretty. And it that's was, one it, of the problems with doing breaking news, especially on television, that the technology is so good. You can be there beyond the scene instantly, more or less, but real, but but tragic events don't play out in in in, in the same timeline that reporters want to cram it into a broadcast. Although uh, uh, Jack Lawrence, maybe you saw some of this. Um, you were in Boston when the uh, marathon bombing happened a few years ago. I thought yes. the local Boston media did an outstanding job covering that. And yes, I think it sure Channel did. Four that was oh, live sure anyway because they had the rights to the to the marathon itself, and there were cameras right at the finish line. So they were yeah. right there when the first blast went off. Originally, though, I think one of them said something like it could be a gas explosion underneath, but that was really, they just got rid of that real fast and they said, this is what it is. Yeah, I remember that. I was in my office at the time. If you fast forward 23 years with technology today and think of the 9-11 bombing or the plane crash, whatever, think of what technology today, how they would have handled it or how it all would have come together. 23 years later with, you know, the emergence of things like AI, for example, uh, and what video technology has evolved into and oh, yeah. cameras and, and everything else. I just wonder how it would have been handled today. More well, one of the big differences would have been that everybody with a cell phone yep. had a camera. Yeah. yeah. I everybody mean, had I mean, a camera. You would, you would have 50 it, million exactly. different videos. Yeah. yeah, and on social media, it would be I, I, I'd be swamped with. Right. Yeah. You probably mm -hmm. would have gotten a lot of stuff that was sent out from the towers 
from people inside as absolutely oh yeah. yeah right absolutely yeah you know, I have to of plan 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 outside of New York City or L.A. or someplace, if, if if that kind of a disaster happened in Peoria or Poughkeepsie or someplace with with less stations, less prominent stations and less news staff, that would be a problem for the public because they wouldn't get accurate reportage at all because there's no reporters left out there. Yeah. yeah. I have a friend who uh, who was working. She was a traffic reporter in, in New York, and she was working in the World Trade Center in 1993 when the building was bombed the first time. Yeah. Yeah. In the parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know have over here. Though, one of the things that really, really strikes me is when you're talking about such a serious subject and Lee Gordon is wearing his Easter egg shirt. Somehow, you know, I could just, if there was an Easter egg shirt that morning. I don't know how credible that would have been. But I was, um, uh, I was in New York City the night before at the Michael Jackson concert. And that may have been, I'm not, not, that may have been the last time that he performed. He's with the Jackson Five. And at the last minute, I got a ticket to go with my buddy Gary Mead. And we went down there. And that night, we actually almost stayed over. And we just grabbed the train on the way out. And then as I was getting dressed for work the next morning, I saw it. But man, oh, man, they actually think I think Jackson may have been stayed over and, and was uh, stuck in that whole thing. But to be that close, man, that was terrifying. Oh. And I and my my buddy, um, Adam Gronsky, was down there during that time and in radio down there. And he kind of, you know, well, was one of the guys running out of the building. The WR Studios were right down the street, basically. Really? The no, WR Studios, yeah, right that's lower Manhattan. Yeah. What's interesting is when you work in New York, you, you take it for granted and you don't go down and visit it. Like, um, I mean, I've been in the Empire State Building. I've been down to the area where the World Trade Center is, but I never went in. I never went. He figured, well, I'll catch it the next time, you know. Uh, and all of a sudden there is no no next time. When I worked in New York, uh, the, the World Trade Center was still a brand new building. Mm -hmm. Everybody was talking about it. I think CBS FM had its towers at the time on top of the World Trade Center because they had a power outage when I was in New York on the air in 1977. And um, the studios went black. They had no backup generator at the studio, but we did have a generator at the at the World Trade Center. So you know, one of the engineers had a portable radio and said, look, it, we got a signal. We're broadcasting. But we can't get from here to there with our with our uh, programming. Yeah, how many uh, radio stations were broadcasting from the World Trade Center? There were quite a few in that antenna, weren't there? Uh, yeah. I yeah, I believe there and were TV too. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if they stayed. I don't know if they stayed on the World Trade Center at CBS. Oh, afterwards, but 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 there were a lot of stations. I think were off the air. Obviously, oh, as, yeah. as soon as those towers came down. Oh yeah. Well, I know I ABC. Think... ABC was because. Uh, ESPN, because we were owned by Disney, ABC, we immediately took over their news area and they were sending us clips. And then we were broadcasting it out over ESPN. And it was, uh, then they sent us a studio feed of their studio. So you were looking at the CS, uh, the ABC uh, newscasters, and then we were playing their clips back there. We actually became ABC for that time, that duration of, uh, uh, for that day, and uh, it was uh, it was amazing. A no just... color. Hey, yeah. hey, Dave. How long was it, Dave, before ABC was able to get all that back? Because you know the tower, like you said, the t their tower had gone down, and the top, uh, their radio tower had gone down, and I when think, the towers came down, yeah, it took them. Uh, it was a day, and I think they wound up uh, broadcasting it. Um, I think we were. I don't trying to th trying to remember if it was. Uh, I know the first day it was, and I'm not sure about the second day, uh, about the whole incident, because I was off that day. And um, so it uh, didn't take long. It didn't take them long to uh, convert over to another uh, to another facility for the transmitting, because I think they had a transmitter in New Jersey mm -hmm. and with a tower. Mm -hmm. And but by the time, you know, we they wanted to get everything fast. So they shipped everything over to us. And we were sending it out. It was it was one. It was a it was a hectic day. It really was. Radio, was was there uh, was there a uh, radio tower affected with that too, Dave, or was that somewhere else? Uh, I I don't know how many radio towers they. Uh, that time, I think say, ABC owned WPLJ in New York, which is a big yeah. station. I don't know where their transmitter was. But the, they were in the Empire State Building, I think. Oh, but they the, were. But 
Yeah, but uh, the, I think it was PAT that was on the, the, the was on the World Trade Center. I, I had taken a bunch of kids. I, I used to like volunteer in the Bridgeport school system. Uh, it's called a project business thing. And we ended up taking a trip to New York and, and we took all the kids up to the top of the World Trade Center. That's and I remember trip. there was a single bay. Um, you know, there were all the antennas in the main part. And then there was this one single bay antenna sort of on the edge of the World Trade Center. And I think that was PAT, but I'm not sure. But there was a there were backup antennas on the Chrysler building. So a lot of the FMs, uh, you know, got back on the air on the Chrysler building. I think WABC, New Jersey, I think was in Lodi, New Jersey, weren't they? WABC Sorry. radio is right off the uh, New Jersey turnpike. Turnpike, yeah. Yeah, it's right there. Um, it's a single tower. Yeah, you can yeah. see all the towers as you're driving on uh, on the turnpike, yeah. I went to college yeah. in New Jersey in 67, 68, and I, on my on the way to school, I, I was would see the World Trade Center being built. So, uh, yeah. Right. So I'd go up. Yeah, you know something, when you think about how radio uh, really did, does shine in a disaster, and keep in mind that, you know, television can have all kinds of challenges. It's interesting when they talk about getting rid of AM radio, and they talk about all these other things, you know, what would happen if, if, um, if everything was like, you know, you know, Sirius XM and all that, what would, what would, it would be tragic to see what would happen to that kind of um, instant type of news that radio can give you. Yeah. Yeah. That's you're true. Right. Yeah. I'm reading an article here. It says that there are only four FM stations on top of the uh, World Trade Center, WKCR, WKTU, WNYC, and WPAT. So I guess the rest of them were on top of the uh, Empire State Building. Empire State Building, yeah. And how does it say what the TV stations were? Was that when they came down? I think all the TV stations were on top of there. I, I'll have to look that up. I don't see no, that. The, the, yeah, what you're talking about is the stations that are currently on the World Trade Center, right? No, no. It says here uh, uh, they were they were home. The World Trade Center towers were home to four FM radio. Oh, gotcha. When, when, it came, 11, when it came down, what, yeah. Yeah. I guess what I'm saying is, it did, were they the uh, the stations that were broadcasting when the buildings came down? I mean, I I I, I know an engineer told me that we were on the. Uh, I say we CBS FM at the time was on was on top of that, and that was seventy seven. So. You know, yeah. I don't know. I'm just, I, 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 when I heard you guys discussing it, I decided yeah. to look. That's what I found so far. Maybe, uh, maybe there's more info somewhere. Yeah, that, but, but you know, that's the scary thing with you know, with all with the 24 hour news cycle. And how do you know? I mean, you know, what do they do? I get there and kind of speculate. I mean, talk about having to, you know, tap dance and BS and ad lib while all that stuff is going on. It's almost scary because that's how things can happen. Yeah. Right, everybody wants to really great joining you. Look forward to more sessions. Take care. Right. Hey, thanks nice a lot. Hey, Dick. Yeah. Thank Stay you. Dick. Okay. What? Uh, what I? Um, you going to? Okay. I am leaving. I am leaving as well. Have a great holiday. Well, let's I do this. Too. Happy Easter to everybody, and uh, we'll be back again uh, next weekend, um, and uh, do it again next Friday if that works for you guys. And that'll be and then happy Easter. Again, that Happy, Easter, Happy everybody. Easter, everybody. Yep. Happy Easter. Bye bye. All right. April 5th. Uh, I probably got that one wrong. <laughs> Happy Easter, everybody. Your friend, your friend has got a lot to share.